The hearing will now come to order. I want to welcome everyone to our first hearing of the Military Personnel Subcommittee of the 118th Congress. Today's hearing is focused on COVID-19's impact on the Department of Defense and its service members. I want to thank our witnesses for being with us today and for their service and support of the DOD and the military departments. I also want to thank the thousands of service members, active duty, reservists, and guard members who answered the call and put service in front of self to support COVID-19 operations throughout the United States, let alone those serving in our VA and civilian healthcare facilities who were on the front lines in the battle against COVID-19. And of course, the men and women serving as emergency responders, whether they were police, firefighters, or in any other capacity, we could not have beaten COVID-19 without your efforts. Thank you. Although not the focus of today's hearing, I would be remiss if I did not mention the need to understand the origins of COVID-19 and the role that China played in a pandemic that killed over 1.1 million innocent Americans to include 96 military service members. There is no doubt that China must be held accountable for its actions in the COVID-19 pandemic. Now for this hearing, I understand there was a flurry of activity late on Friday afternoon and through the weekend within DOD and the services releasing implementing guidance on the COVID-19 vaccination rescission. This is good news for our service members and their families. However, the timing of, these re of the release of these policies, essentially two business days before this hearing, is awfully curious. I think this committee's aggressive oversight was instrumental in getting the implementing guidance released. There is nothing like the threat of a hearing and the potential to be called to task for not complying with a, stat with, with a statute to prompt action. While I'm glad to see DOD and the services now implementing the rescission, note that the NDAA was signed into law on December 23, 2022. The SecDev's initial guidance was issued on January 10, 2023. All of the rescission guidance should have been completed within 30 days of signing the NDAA. Yet here we are at the end of February, almost March, before this, this uh, guidance was promulgated. I'm also disappointed in the lack of responsiveness of DOD and the military department to get back to the committee on questions that are important to our oversight responsibilities and also to our service members. So much so that Chairman Rogers and I found it necess necessary to write a letter to Secretary Austin with a whole host of questions on COVID-19. I note that OSD ch chose to send their reply to this letter last night, giving us a little time to review their responses. I also have to mention that many of our committee members are disappointed with DOD's issuance of its reproductive health care policy, or as many call it, the DOD abortion travel policy. While this will not be the focus of today's hearing, the release of this policy was ruled out with no advanced discussion with the committee and serves as another example of the Biden administration using the Department of Defense as a social reform laboratory. Finally, because this is our first hearing in 2023, I would like to acknowledge that this year marks the 50th anniversary of our transition to an all-volunteer force. Fiscal year 2022 was the single worst year for military recruiting since that transition, and it's important for this subcommittee to figure out why. As far as our hearing today, I am looking forward to this discussion and affording our members the opportunity to ask their questions on DOD's response to COVID-19. I wanna welcome all of our witnesses. First, the Honorable uh, Gilbert Cisneros, Jr., the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness Department of Defense. Secondly, the Honorable Gabe Camarillo, Undersecretary of the Army, Department of the Army and the Honorable Frank Raven, Undersecretary of the Navy, Department of the Navy, and the Honorable Gina Jones, Undersecretary of the Air Force, Department of the Air Force. Before hearing from them uh, and our, our witnesses, let me offer Ranking Member Kim an opportunity to make his opening remarks as well. Thank you, Chairman, thank you. Um, this is our first hearing of this vital subcommittee. We are charged with supporting our service members and their families, and I can think of nothing our Congress can do that is more meaningful than that. 
We can and should review how the pandemic affected the Department of Defense. Nearly three quarters of a million people affiliated with DOD were infected by COVID-19. Thousands were hospitalized and hundreds died. Every loss of life is tragic and we hope that the actions taken during the pandemic minimize the loss. We also cannot ignore the toll that the pandemic had had on our service members and their families who are facing childcare closures, delayed PCS moves, and limited access to healthcare. While I recognize the value of reviewing the actions of DOD during this heart of the pandemic, including a mandate that's no longer in effect, I look forward to working with the chairman and my colleagues in a bipartisan manner on other matters more immediately impacting our national security and the quality of life of our service members and their families, from troubling data on military suicides across the services to chronic childcare shortages across military bases to challenges accessing health care. There are many areas where I'm confident we can find common ground on matters under the purview of our subcommittee. Yes, there are deep divisions in our politics in Congress, but if ever there was a place where we could come together, it would be in this committee charged with supporting those that protect us. Let's focus on where we can come together and get things done and not immediately jump to where we have divisions. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, DOD has remained agile on two very important fronts. First, the department played a critical role in meeting the whole of government needs by providing healthcare workers and logistics expertise, among others. In addition, the department responded to shifting force health protection guidance. As we start today's hearing, I believe DOD and the services have all complied with the NDAA provisions rescinding the COVID-19 vaccine mandate. And while the vast majority of service members across all components complied, with the vaccine requirement, a small percentage of them decided for various reasons to either refuse to vaccinate or seek an exemption. There are legitimate questions to discuss here. For those who sought an exemption, I want to know from each of the military departments how they established a COVID-19 vaccine exemption process and whether those processes were standardized as required by the NDAA. I'm particularly interested on this issue as it relates to discharge characterizations, which is an important factor since these characterizations impact benefits after the service member has transitioned to civilian life. But as we engage in this discussion today, let's keep the politics out of it and approach with calm and civility. Let's keep perspective that decisions were made in the chaos of the pandemic with the focus on saving lives. We can seek to learn best practices and always improve in how we care for those who serve us. Let's keep in mind the perspective that vaccine requirements are not new to the military. As the Congressional Research Services points out that, quote, the US military instituted its first vaccination program in 1777 when General George Washington directed the Continental Army to be protected from smallpox. Let's keep perspective that there are currently up to 17 vaccines required for service members, some for all and others based on jobs and deployment. And I'll end by just simply reading this statement that House Armed Services Committee Chair Mike Rogers released in 2021 when he was a ranking member and the vaccine mandate was first sought. He said, quote, vaccines protect our men and women, many of whom live in cramped and crowded conditions from the spread of disease while at home or deployed across the globe. Teleworking isn't an option for the soldiers, sailors, Marine, airmen, and guardians who work every day to confront near peer rivals and non-state terrorists. We must not allow COVID-19 to be a hindrance on our force. Secretary Austin earlier confirmed that as of mid-July, this is in 2021, over 70% of active duty troops had received at least one vaccine shot. That is encouraging news, and I hope that number reaches 100% quickly. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the ranking member. Uh, I ask for unanimous consent to allow members not on the subcommittee to participate in today's hearing and be allowed to ask questions after all subcommittee members have been recognized. Each witness will have the opportunity to present his or her testimony and each member will have an opportunity to question the witnesses for five minutes. We respectfully ask the witnesses to summarize their testimony in five minutes or less. Your written comments and statements were made part of the hearing record. With that, Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel Readiness, Mr. Cisneros, you may make your opening statement. Chairman Banks, Ranking Member Kim, and members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on the status of the Department of Defense's actions to confront the COVID-19 pandemic, protect our personnel across the total force, and ensure that the U.S. military can fight and win whenever needed in defense of the United States. Since the pandemic began, the civ civilian and defense and military leaders of the department across two administrations has led a highly effective response to an invisible, novel, and evolving threat 
I appreciate the opportunity to share our experiences. The pandemic has nothing short of a, was nothing short of a national and global tragedy. More than 1.1 million Americans' lives were lost to COVID-19, including 96 service members. People are my top priority, and we all mourn the loss of our people to this awful disease. The department's response to the COVID-19 pandemic was historic and complex. Members of the armed forces on active duty in the reserves and in the National Guard helped staff and operate testing and vaccination sites, provided medical and logistical support to stress hospitals and overburdened civilian medical systems, and transported critical medical supplies when global supply chains froze. The nation is stronger thanks to the department's swift and effective actions, which helped save the lives of many Americans both in and out of uniform. The Department of Defense and the military services took bold, necessary steps to protect the force and its ability to operate in response to this new threat. These consisted of multi-layered approaches to force health protection, including distancing, masking requirements, testing, uh, staggered work schedules, remote work when possible, pre-deployment restrictions of movement, and mass immunization of the force. And when the COVID-19 vaccination became available, our service members received the vaccine to protect themselves, their teammates, and their family members. Today, more than 2 million service members, over 96%, are vaccinated against COVID-19. Vaccination requirements for military personnel are not new and are important to maintain individual medical readiness and reduce risk to mission. A small fraction of service members who did not request or receive an exemption or accommodation from the requirement to be vaccinated against COVID-19 refused to receive the COVID-19 vaccine even after receiving a lawful order to do so and approximately 8,100 were subsequently separated. Compliance with lawful orders is not optional in the military and leaders within the military service took appropriate disciplinary action, including separation when appropriate to maintain good order and discipline. The combination of these measures enabled the U.S. military to continue crucial operations and a amongst a, amid a challenging global threat environment. These policies continue to succeed at protecting our people and the nation's security. The department's prompt and effective action saved countless lives and ensured critical mission readiness to defend the United States against all national security threats. In December 2022, for the first time in history, Congress passed legislation to rescind the vaccination requirement for service members. The department has complied with the NDAA requirements. On January 10, 2023, Secretary Austin signed a memorandum rescinding the COVID-19 vaccination requirement as required by statute and indicating that the department will continue to promote and encourage COVID-19 vaccination for all service members. On February 24th, Deputy Secretary of Defense Hicks published a memorandum directing DOD component heads to formally rescind policies, directives, and guidance related to COVID-19 vaccination requirements as soon as possible if they have not done so already, and to certify in writing to my office that these actions have been completed no later than March 17, 2023. Let me be clear. As we sit here today, there is no COVID-19 vaccination requirement for service members or any other Department of Defense personnel. The military services no longer require COVID-19 vaccinations for sessions to or retention in their respective military service. This includes all new military sessions, enlisted and officer, as well as cadets and midshipmen and officer commissioning programs. The department continues to encourage service members and civilian employees to receive the COVID-19 vaccine and boosters. In this year of major milestones, the 50th anniversary of the all-volunteer force and the 75th anniversary of President Truman's executive order to provide equality of treatment and opportunity for all service members, the dedication of our total force to ensure mission readiness and defend America's national security is a critical message for young Americans. I appreciate the opportunity to showcase the collective power of our department against an overwhelming challenge, the COVID-19 pandemic. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Camarillo. Chairman Banks, Ranking Member Kim, distinguished members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you, before you on behalf of the soldiers in the United States Army. The Army's response to the COVID-19 pandemic allowed us to keep our people safe and fulfill critical mission requirements. I'm particularly proud that as part of an interagency team, the Army took a significant role in acquiring and distributing COVID-19 vaccines, medical treatments, ventilators, gloves, and other equipment to places where they were needed the most. The Army showed, yet again, that in times of crisis, we will answer the nation's call. 
Unfortunately, COVID-19 took hundreds of lives in the Army community, but we took deliberate steps to protect our personnel. Across two administrations, the Army took decisive action to protect our soldiers, civilians, and their families, and to prevent, prevent additional deaths. Those efforts included instituting teleworking policies, contact tracing protocols, and implementing Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin's requirement to vaccinate our service members in 2021. These steps followed department-wide policy and expert medical advice. Our efforts enabled the Army to continue to participate in training events and exercises, conduct operations worldwide, and to maintain a high level of readiness throughout the pandemic. The Army implemented the vaccine requirement carefully. We first educated the force on the benefits of the vaccine. We also explained the exemption process to each of our soldiers. For soldiers who requested religious accommodations, the Army gave each a careful and individualized review to ensure that we upheld constitutionally protected First Amendment rights. Our deliberate review process considered the specific facts of each individual case, seeking to determine whether accommodations were feasible. We also processed numerous medical exemption requests based on a physician's recommendation. Soldiers who refused the order to be vaccinated without an approved or pending accommodation or exemption request were subject to adverse administrative actions. Beginning in February of 2022, regular Army soldiers who continued to refuse the vaccination order were subject to involuntary separation. Given the unique circumstances in the National Guard and Reserve, we took a deliberate methodical approach to reserve component vaccine implementation. Our efforts resulted in the Army successfully administering vaccinations to over 900,000 soldiers, achieving a vaccination rate of over 94% across the total force, including 98% in the active component and over 91% for the reserve component. Following last year's NDAA, the Army promptly implemented the law and terminated its requirement to vaccinate all soldiers against COVID-19. We also directed commands to suspend involuntary separations and any adverse administrative actions based solely on a soldier's refusal to comply with the order to become vaccinated. And ultimately, to further reinforce our compliance with the NDAA, on February 24th, Secretary Warmoth rescinded the Army's prior directive implementing the COVID-19 vaccine mandate and governing enforcement. This new policy describes how the Army will handle remaining issues related to the required uh, rescinded mandate, including cases in which soldiers have pending religious accommodation requests for multiple vaccines. It also makes clear, as has been the case since Secretary Austin ended the vaccine mandate in January, that receiving the COVID vaccine is not a requirement for joining the Army. Soldiers who disagree about how their cases were handled can seek relief through the Army Board of Correction for military records. I remain deeply proud of the Army's response to the global pandemic and our collective efforts over two administrations to promote our people's health and well being. As the pandemic showed us, our soldiers are always ready to defend our nation and to contribute to our security and well being. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raven. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Banks, Ranking Member Kim, and distinguished members of this subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the actions of the Department of the Navy to combat the COVID-19 pandemic and our recently announced policies on COVID-19 vaccinations. I want to state up front, the rescission of the COVID-19 vaccination mandate is in effect. Within the Department of the Navy, including our service academy, there are no limitations for accession, assignment, or deployment based on COVID-19 vaccination. We have updated policy and distributed new guidance in accordance with the law to ensure this direction is clear and consistently enforced. It is said that adversity doesn't build character, it reveals it. The adversity brought by the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed that the Department of the Navy's character is strong and true. On behalf of Navy Secretary Del Toro and the senior civilian and military leadership of the Navy and Marine Corps, I want to convey how proud we are of the sailors, Marines, and civil servants. We are proud to have led in the development, distribution, and widespread administration of a vaccine to fight a deadly disease that, to date, has killed over 1.1 million fellow Americans, including 18 uniformed members of the Navy and Marine Corps. 
We are proud of our leaders at every level who implemented and enforced the lawful COVID-19 vaccine mandate that ultimately led to a vaccination rate of 97% for service members and 91% for Department of the Navy civilians. We are proud of our people who maintained high levels of readiness, including medical readiness through vaccinations, to ensure our Navy and Marine Corps could support and defend our nation and our way of life, despite the enormous challenges of a global pandemic. These challenges included battling a contagious disease while training future service members in the close quarters of our recruit training depots, or deploying across the globe in the tight confines of a Navy ship. And we are especially proud of what our sailors and Marines did to help our nation in direct response to the pandemic, deploying thousands of active and reserve forces across the nation, some to your own districts, to increase our medical capacity, as well as facilitate logistical and medical supply requirements. Safeguarding the health and welfare of a force is indispensable for the success of any military organization. This continues to be a priority for the Department of the Navy. Although the COVID-19 vaccine mandate has been rescinded, we will not relax our vigilance to protect our people and their mission. We will continue to promote vaccinations to maintain medical readiness across the force and to make the COVID-19 vaccination widely available. I'm confident that our high vaccination rate across the Don both saved lives and kept our service members in the fight. The Don, through, depart through the continued support of Congress, is focus uh, focused on producing, deploying, and sustaining naval expeditionary forces that will perform successfully across the globe in the full range of military operations, from maintaining deterrence during peacetime to defeating with overwhelming force when necessary. COVID-19 will not likely be the last disease to threaten the readiness of our military. We have many lessons learned from our COVID-19 response to ensure we are minimizing addressable risks and, uh, and are prepared to take decisive action in future crises, as we did to battle COVID-19, to maintain the credibility and capability of our forces. Throughout this pandemic, your fleet remains strong. Your Marines and sailors are have been and always will be ready and able to provide worldwide response 24 seven. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Good afternoon, Chairman Banks, Ranking Member Kim, distinguished members of the Armed Services Committee and this subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. It is my pleasure to be able to discuss the Department of the Air Force's highly effective efforts throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. The steps used to protect our total force, both military and civilian, enable the DAF to continue protecting the nation and defend its interests around the globe at a time of unprecedented challenge. I will also address the efforts underway to implement the rescission of the mandate while continuing to take care of our personnel and execute global missions on a daily basis. I am grateful to be sitting here today speaking without a mask on with relatively high confidence that, that I will remain healthy and that if I fall ill, the risk of death from the effects of COVID-19 are far less likely than early in the pandemic. Additionally, I'm grateful that we have efficacious treatments should they be needed. This was not the case 26 months ago. December 2020, when the FDA first granted the emergency use authorization for the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine was the deadliest month for COVID-19 related deaths in the United States. That month, our nation experienced more than 65,000 confirmed and probable COVID-19 related deaths, raising our total count to over 334,000 deaths since the start of the pandemic. It was also that month that the Center for Disease Control and Prevention initiated new travel restrictions to and from the United Kingdom, where we have a significant force presence to contain a new variant that was 70% more transmissible. When Secretary of Defense Austin mandated immunization for service members on August 24, 2021, our national death toll had risen to over 634,000. Those circumstances drove the Department of the Air Force's decision to implement the earliest vaccination deadline amongst the military departments. The decision to immunize was the right decision at the time and in fact the only choice given the criticality of our mission. I will never forget those dire summer months when I would receive a notification, sometimes as many as two a day, about a DAF teammate who died due to COVID-19 related complications, only to read they were unvaccinated. Vaccination was essential in allowing us to deploy, rotate our forces to countries that mandated vaccination, and most importantly, keep the men, women, and dependents of the DAF healthy. As they have for decades, the vast majority of our airmen and guardians complied with the lawful order to vaccinate. 
Of the over 500,000 total force airmen and guardians, approximately 98% followed the Secretary of Defense's lawful order. As a result, our force was able to focus on the mission. While vaccination has received the overwhelming majority of public attention, I want to reinforce that the department did not rely solely on immunization to protect the force. The DAF, in concert with the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the other services, took a holistic approach to combat COVID-19. Through a series of prophylactic measures, such as masking, physical distancing, telework, remote work, travel, and deployment restrictions and control, we maintained readiness while much of industry and the commercial sector ground to a standstill. The DAF continued our flying mission, operating from austere locations, conducting worldwide operations, executing strike and mobility operations in support of the joint force, maintaining our nuclear deterrent, and ensuring we continued to induct and train our force. Our collective safety measures kept our depots running, facilities maintained, bases operating, and missions executed. The DAF simultaneously supported national efforts to augment civilian emergency response, mass testing, immunization, and healthcare infrastructure, notably hospitals operating beyond capacity. The Air Force Medical Service deployed 2,700 total force airmen uh, in support of COVID-19 response operations during the pandemic. We deployed 10 vaccination teams to 10 cities in nine states to deliver 1.6 million vaccinations. And we deployed 612 medical personnel to support 33 locations in 18 states, many of which represented on this committee today, to provide inpatient critical care at hospitals experiencing significant personnel shortages. We will only be able to do this because of the vaccination rates within our force. On January 10th, Secretary Austin rescinded the vaccination mandate for military personnel at the direction of Congress. Accordingly, on January 23rd, Secretary Kindle formally rescinded his order to vaccinate as well as the force implementation guidance associated with the mandate. We are actively working with OSD and the other services to expeditiously implement Secretary Austin's guidance. We also have ceased ongoing reviews of current service members' religious, administrative, or medical accommodation requests for exemption from the vaccine to include accommodation denial appeals. Additionally, we have taken steps to ensure that no bars to enlistment or commissioning to to include those commissions that were held in in abeyance. Let me close by expressing my profound respect for the men and women of the DAF for their tenacity, resolve, hard work, and resilience and indomitable spirit in the face of this pandemic. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before the committee, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, Thank you to each of you. I'll begin with questions. Um, Mr. Cisneros, last night, OSD replied to a February 12th letter from me and Chairman Rogers regarding DOD's COVID policies. I'm going to quote a few lines from the response. Military services, services officials are determining, quote, appropriate action for service members who did not submit an exemption or accommodation request, remained unvaccinated, and refused a lawful order to take the vaccine, end quote. My first question is, why are officials in the services still reviewing these cases if the COVID-19 vaccine mandate was rescinded? Well, thank you for the question there, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. You know, this is a a situation we've never really been in before where we've actually had to go through a process of of repealing a vaccine that we've mandated uh, and Congress initiating a a, a statute to make us take it back. Um, This is a new process for us. It's something we're trying to figure out and we've been working on it. Um, The situation that you just described was members who refused the vaccine, uh, who, who disobeyed a lawful order. Um, The services are going through a process uh, to look at that and and, and evaluate what needs to be done in those situations. And for more information, I can turn it over to the services to kind of have them reflect. So your answer is that the reason that we're still reviewing cases after the vaccine mandate was rescinded is because they disobeyed a lawful order. Is that what I heard heard you say? Those who refused the vaccine and did not put in uh, a request for accommodation uh, refused a lawful order. That is correct. But expand for a minute. For a minute, just what, what's the point? If we rescinded the mandate, what's the point of continuing to review the cases? Well, the reviewing the cases because, as I said, they re- they obeyed a lawful order, and in order to maintain good order and discipline, it's very important that our service members go and follow lo- orders when they are lawful, and and there were several or thousands that did not, and so their services are going through a process to review those cases 
to make a determination what needs to be done. All right, then, then there was this statement, quote, no service members currently serving will be separated based solely on their refusal to receive the COVID-19 vaccination. If they sought an accommodation based on religious, administrative, or medical grounds, end quote. So if service members did not receive or seek an accommodation for the COVID-19 vaccination, are you still planning to separate those service members? That is up to the services, but no, as the statement said, no individual is being separated for refusing the COVID-19 vaccine. If individuals have been separated, they have been, were separated because they disobeyed a lawful order. Any, any of you able to respond to that? Mr. Camarillo. Mr. Chairman, uh, there are a number of cases that we still have yet to review for individual soldiers that, as Secretary Cisnero said, chose to no, not comply with a lawful order. Uh, I would just add that each of these cases has to be evaluated on its own individual merits because they're highly fact specific. There may be in any instance uh, numerous uh, violations of the UCMJ or other uh, you know, other areas in which there might be uh, circumstances in which to, to look at disciplinary procedures. So we'd have to look at them all individually on a case-by-case -case basis. Mr. Raven. Uh, that, that's exactly right. Uh, we, are we are determined to look at each of these cases on the uh, merits of uh, the facts of each case, and we will conduct an individualized review of each one of these cases. Ms. Jones. Yeah, let me just say, I mean, we have um, implemented um, guidance to rescind uh, the, the mandate. We're not reviewing any further um, exemptions. Those have been referred to the uh, return to the service members without action. Um, the, uh, you know, as captured by my colleagues, um, we're doing this expeditiously and, and look forward to um, working toward the 17, for, uh, 17 March um, uh, deadline that PNR has put in place to make sure all these things are, are fully rescinded. Yeah. I I know you're going to hear from a lot of my colleagues today who are infuriated about the, the double um, standard and message that you're sending to our troops, rescinding a policy and then still punishing them for, um, the, the, for not taking the vaccine. But I'm going to move on and leave that up to some of my colleagues. In his opening statement, Undersecretary Cisneros said that many vaccines are, quote, required for all military personnel who do not already have immunity, end quote. Last week, the Lancet uh, Medical Journal published a study showing that natural immunity is as effective as two doses of the COVID-19 vaccine at preventing severe illness and death. Thousands of service members were discharged and tens of thousands of potential recruits were barred from enlisting because they had not been vaccinated against COVID-19. However, a significant portion of them did have immunity due to a prior COVID infection. Uh, Secretary Cisneros, does the DOD acknowledge the Lancet's conclusion that natural immunity is, a, is as effective as a vaccination? Chair, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe we're still kind of evaluating uh, the results of the COVID and the research that's going through. Um, it's not like uh, chicken pox where if you get it once and you're good, there have been people who have gotten COVID numerous times. And so... Uh, we don't know about natural immunity there as far as, you know, how it works and how effective it is. And so we are going based on the research that we have, and we've continued to update and change our policies as the research has, has progressed and we've gone through this process. But right now, um, there is no more COVID-19 vaccine, although we do still encourage our members to get the vaccination as well as the boosters when they come out. So recruits can be exempt from chicken pox and measles, vaccines if they have natural immunity. Is the DOD considering natural, natural immunity while reviewing cases of service members who refuse the COVID-19 vaccine, or is that off the table? The, you know, again, Mr. Chairman, as the, the research gets better and we learn more about this disease, it's still very, relatively young. It's only been since uh, 2020 that this has been around. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, Good evidence and the research is still going on as to how we need to progress with this. But as for right now, natural, 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 natural immunity uh, is not something that we believe in for this, and so we are still moving forward. But again, right now there is no COVID-19 mandate. There is no COVID-19 requirement for service members to enter the military or to be in the military. 
All right, I'll yield to the ranking member. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I just want to take a step back here because uh, if the four of you have done an exhaustive amount of just review and looking through the last couple years, and I, I guess I just want to kind of tease out from you just what are some of the, the top lessons that you learned about how the department as a whole uh, approach this, uh, and as well as the different services. But if you don't mind, I'll start with Under Secretary Cisneros. You know, given the scope of the DOD response for the whole of government effort in support of the pandemic, you know, what are some of the, the key lessons learned for the department that you think will, will serve us better going forward? You know, one thing I will say is that I, I think the department has shown through this over two administrations of what it can do and what it can accomplish. Um, when it has the resources and, and how quickly it can act. Uh, over the previous administration, uh, Operation Warp Speed was put into effect. The development of a vaccine was initiated. Uh, that was done in record time. Uh, the previous administration uh, had, had, you know, during a, a memo signed by uh, under the former Deputy, under, or Deputy Secretary Norquist was that, you know, as soon as it was the, uh, the the vaccine would be licensed, that they plan to put it into effect and to make it a requirement, as did, uh, you know, so what we did was we just kind of pretty much followed on what the previous administration was doing, and that's why Secretary Austin signed that, uh, the mandate uh, right after the day after the first license of the vaccine came out. But I, I think what we've done and what we showed is that we can really go out and accomplish things. We were able to move uh, supplies around, we were able to, to respond on a, a national basis to support hospitals uh, around uh, the, the nation in order to, to, when they were overworked, we were able to, to build medical hospitals in place of so those places that were overcrowded. Uh, the reaction that we were able to do kind of shows, I think, again, how effective the United States military can be. Now, what we do have in place right now is we do have a, a biodefense uh, review or biodefense posture review going on right now. Uh, where we should hopefully kind of be in uh, in the process, kind of wrapping this up, which will kind of lay out some of the things that we learned over the pandemic, and that will help us prepare, prepare in the future in case this ever happens again. Great. Thank you. Uh, Under Secretary Camarello, anything you want to like to add here? Congressman Kim, uh, just a couple of points I would add. The first is, you know, uh, understanding the Army's role in an interagency response to a national pandemic like this in the future, whether it's contracting to help acquire uh, vaccines uh, and, you know, personal protective equipment and other, other similar items, uh, or certainly the construction through the Corps of Engineers of emergency medical treatment facilities, other areas in which we surged, uh, you know, first responder, um, re you know, response operations across the country. Certainly our ability to do that as part of an interagency team is something we'll take forward. Secondly, the value of an education campaign, as we explained the value and benefit of vaccination across the force and how it, as has been said by my colleagues, enable us to maintain a high level of readiness, ensure that our force was protected. Was there a and particular be able to method of that education campaign that was most successful or, or kind of stood out to you? Uh, well, Congressman, to achieve 94% of the force is something that we're very proud of, and I give a lot of credit to our team, commanders at every level, our Surgeon General, our, our medics, and others, uh, to make sure that they adequately explain the value of these uh, these requirements. Okay, great. Under Secretary Raven, anything you'd like to add? Uh, yes, Mr. Kim, uh, thank you for the question. I, I think there's uh, two key lessons uh, that we take forward. Uh, first of all is our experience working in a whole of government uh, team, uh, not only with our uh, sister services and OSD, but uh, other interagency partners to tackle a global pandemic that impacted uh, life in unimaginable number of ways. Uh, we have a lot of lessons learned about how to increase our participation with, with, these, in, with these key partners. Uh, the second, I would say, is much more tactical, and that's about resiliency and supply chain. Uh, we learned about a lot about uh, shortage of mass. We need to be ahead of the next pandemic. And in terms of resiliency, we've also learned lessons about uh, the challenges of just simply moving people around the globe, uh, not only service members, but their families. And we will keep those uh, lessons in mind as we, uh, as we move forward. Great, thank you. Under Secretary Jones, if you'd like to close this out here. Yeah, Representative Kim, thank you for the question. Um, so first lesson learned, I mean, when your military is vaccinated, your military can step up uh, when many local communities' health infrastructure is unfortunately failing under the, the crushing burden of, of um, the pandemic, as we saw. So if I may, just to get very specific, we were able, again, to put 1.6 million shots into the arms of our fellow Americans. Some of those communities, Gary, Indiana, Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, by Representative Finstead, um, Tampa, 
Tampa, Florida, um, Newark, New Jersey, uh, you know, Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn, New York. I mean, we actually even sent medical personnel into uh, the Hennepin Healthcare System in Minneapolis, the Center of Care, St. Cloud Hospital in, in Minnesota. Again, you know, we showed up when the country needed us. We were proud of what we have done. Again, we were only able to do that because we were vaccinated at the rate we, at we were. 99% in the Air, uh, Department of the Air Force active duty, 98% across the total force. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. I yield back. Mr. Gates, Under Secretary Cisneros, is there a plan to reinstate the roughly 8,600 service members across active duty, the reserves, and the Guard back to their point of service? Thanks for the question there, uh, Representative Gates. Um, service members that have been separated, there is a, a policy uh, procedure for that. They can apply uh, to the Board of Corrections if they have a they think there's a discrepancy in their discharge. They can go and do that procedure process. No, 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 I didn't ask about their options. As far I asked as about the, your specific plan, like, do you have a plan to go get these folks back into service in our military? Well, the the, the policy is the same that has always been, right? If service members are discharged and they want to come back into the service, they can apply. So they can go I talk to, to recruiters. The DoD has do no that. active plan to do proactive outreach to these individuals to get them back in the military. Our plan is the same as it's always been. If okay, so, but it doesn't include that active outreach to get people back, it seems like. Uh, I wanted to ask Undersecretary Raven, did the Navy send out form letters in response to people's requests for religious exemptions? Sir, I'd have to get back to you on that. Really important, though, because the law requires an individualized assessment of people's requests for, an, for a religious exemption, right? Uh, yes, sir. Whatever initial outreach uh, may be, I'll get back to you on that. But in terms of the process we followed, it was individualized review at multiple levels. You, you believe Reach there out. was that individualized review? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, well, it, it, I mean, the inspector general disagrees with you. The, the inspector general issued a report in uh, June of 2022. I'm quoting directly from it. The denial memorandum we reviewed generally did not reflect an individualized analysis. And the IG's report goes on to say that the average uh, amount of time that each package was considered was 12 minutes. Does 12 minutes seem like a sufficient amount of time to make an individual review on someone's deeply held religious basis for an exemption? Uh, sir, the, the process that was followed included multiple reviews at the medical chaplaincy and legal reviews, uh, senior commanders going all the way up to, uh, to headquarters. The uh, Marine Corps established a board with senior level reviews outside the chain of command uh, for each one of these reviews that amounted to, uh, in many cases, more than 10 hours of e review of each case. That's not what the inspector general says. That seems like a self-assessment, not, not a reflection on the assessment. And, you know, for to hear you say that is concerning because it would it would seem to suggest that you guys haven't really taken to the advice into the findings of the IG and, and it also doesn't really comport with what I saw with my own two eyes because I went to naval installations and met with service members who could point to letter memorandum they'd received that were exactly identical you could have held them up to a lamp back to back and it was these people had poured out their faith basis to seek an exemption, and then they got a form letter back. And it, and it sort of goes back to my, my question to Mr. Cisneros, like, are we stronger or weaker as a country because there are 8,600 people that used to wear the uniform, but because of the vax ma mandate, now they don't? Congressman, I would say we're as strong as ever. Uh, we are still a lethal force. Uh, we are, are ready. Our retention has been at record high levels, and we are ready to defend the nation today. I, I think that you'll find in a, in a lot of military communities, they feel like they're not as strong because they see instructor pilots that have been separated, people involved in critical test mission that now are not part of the fighting force. Like, um, Ms. Jones, how many pilots did we lose because of the VAX mandate? Representative, I have to follow up with you on that. I've, I've got a report here from the Epic Times. I don't know if it's true or not, but it, it talks about over 700. Does that number sound about right? Uh, that does not sound right, uh, but I'd have to follow up with you. I'm not familiar with the publication. It strikes me as something we should really know, Mr. Chairman. I mean, you know, right now we've got an Air Force that faces a pilot shortage, and we, we should know at this hearing, and, and I hope we'll get for the record how many pilots we lost, because I think that if you lost hundreds of pilots, it would be really hard to make the argument that you made that we're a stronger country because of it. How about special operators? I know how much money we put into special operators. Do we lose any of them because of the VAX mandate? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of your question. Do we lose any special operators because of the VAX mandate? 
You would have berets. to ask the, the services to that for their specific the amount of uh, Camarillo, do we lose any green berets? I'd have to take that for the record. I don't have the breakout. Gosh, Mr. Chairman. Representative Gates, may I follow up with you? Please. We actually did not discharge any officers um, as a result of them, uh, Department of the Air Force officers, as a result of them failing to obey the lawful order. For those that opted to voluntarily separate or volunteer or retire in lieu of, um, then that was they, they voluntarily did that. In, in do we know that number? Because I think I do uh, actually. Would okay. you like it? Yes, please. Yes. Um, so those folks that um, opted to. Um, uh, let me, it's on the other chart. But let me, um, there were 610 folks that were, that were, um, that were separated, um, and a, just a small amount of those folks that were uh, I, I sure hope so we could get, I would hope we I can have them back. I can provide it for the record. Great, and Mr. Chairman, just as I yield back my time to you, I think the breakdown of some of these folks who we invest so much time into yeah. training and to see how many of those we lost and to be able to assess mm -hmm. readiness would be important work for our committee going forward. I appreciate mm -hmm. your indulgence and I yield back. Thank it was uh, agree. 40 office, Air Force officers separated in lieu of, separated in lieu of 14 officers separated, uh, retired in lieu of, but it can provide that formally. Ms. Hulan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for your testimony today. And also, um, just a point of order, having served and having been asked lawfully to have vaccinations for the good of the service, for the good of the nation, the people who are now currently in the military, I believe are in a better position because they have obeyed and followed due and lawful orders. And so uh, good honor and discipline has been upheld and maintained. And so I would argue that we are in a, str in a stronger position now than we were before. Um, I will turn though to the subject of the hearing uh, at large, which is COVID-19's impact on DOD and its service members and wanna talk about specifically childcare and family issues. Uh, we all know throughout the pandemic that access to childcare was an issue, a huge problem for millions of families and of course for those in uh, military as well. As someone who separated myself personally from the Air Force due to childcare issues among others, I'm particularly concerned about the impact that closures of those centers both on military bases as well as uh, off of them might have had on military retention and recruitment during COVID. Would you be able, each of you, to provide a brief update on the reopening of those child care centers in your branches, and how did a lack of sustained access to child care potentially impact our military families uh, in terms of retention and otherwise? And finally, for Mr. Cisneros, uh, what lessons have we learned about how to maintain and reopen child care operations? Uh, because we hopefully will never see COVID again, but might. I'll start with, um, or, uh, <laughs> it's hard to say. Uh, I'm trying not to say Gina. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Honorable Undersecretary Jones. Understood. Uh, no, thank you for the question. And if I may, um, I applaud your and Representative Vice's uh, bipartisan efforts um, on the uh, on the family leave program. The um, on, on the child care piece, uh, you're absolutely correct in terms of you know there was no aspect of our military installations that was not impacted by by the pandemic, and certainly our, our CDCs are, are within that. And, and honestly, we are still continuing uh, to to recover from that. Uh, many of our CDCs are are under staffed. Um, you know, the staffing shortage across the country, again, is similarly impacting our own. Um, and so we are working uh, very, uh, very hard to, to get those staffed to ensure that, again, our folks can focus on mission and not focus on long, long wait times at, at CDCs. Very proud of the fact that, um, you know, Secretary Austin's Taking Care of People initiative, um, as part of that, uh, we actually went above and beyond what was asked for. And uh, for those folks that come and work for the Department of the Air Force as a direct child care provider, their first... Um, um, their first child would be covered 100%, right? Again, we know um, how important child care is, even to the child care providers. And so going above, we wanted to make sure we could look our airmen and guardians in the eye and say we are doing absolutely everything we can do to get those CDCs staffed uh, so, you can, so you can focus again on mission. I would really uh, thank you for the, for the question, though, and continue to look forward to working with the committee on, on that uh, in particular. Secretary Raymond, please. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, absolutely, uh, the uh, the women and men who work at uh, both uh, CDCs and in our uh, in our schools are 
vital to readiness because they provide the support to military families that allow service members to do their job. It's an incredibly important mission, and we value that at the Department of the Navy. Uh, we, like the rest of the country, continue to experience the same shortfalls uh, that exist in the private sector. Uh, we are looking at innovative ways to, uh, to get after those issues. Uh, just a couple of examples. Uh, we have partnered with the Co uh, Coronado School District uh, to make use of a facility that was no longer being used for, uh, for public school and are now working to uh, um, uh, uh, transition that into a child development center. We have also initiated outreach with uh, some colleges uh, to, uh, to essentially um, uh, uplift the, uh, the program uh, in terms of a pipeline of uh, talented professionals into this very important career area. Uh, and we continue to work with, uh, with uh, PNR and Under Secretary Cisneros on really cross-cutting initiatives to make sure that this, uh, this important service is as robust as we need it to be. Secretary Camarillo, please. Congresswoman, uh, just to expand on what my colleagues have said, absolutely critical issue. I think in direct response to your question, during the pandemic, you know, we saw the urgent need to make sure that we kept our CDC workers on staff and paid even as these CDCs were closed down. But as everybody knows, it exacerbated the larger problem we have regarding access to childcare. And it's for these reasons that we've all said, Secretary Warmoth has established a very ambitious goal to make sure that in the Army, you know, we have to place children in childcare within 30 days of the need, whether it's on or off in installations, whether it's in a CDC, through Army fee assistance, uh, or in-home providers that are appropriately licensed to do that. And we're taking all the efforts at our disposal to make sure that we can grant access to childcare. Thank you. I've run out of time and I yield back. Mr. Alford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking Member Kim, appreciate you uh, having these witnesses here before us. Thank you for being here, taking your time out. I'm honored to uh, represent two vital military installations in the 4th Congressional District of the great state of Missouri, that being Fort Leonard Wood and Whiteman Air Force Base, home of the B-2 Stealth Bomber. Um, Fort Leonard Wood, of course, is a critical asset to our military. We train uh, more than 80,000 personnel each year there. You know, our military has incredible capabilities, and we're all very proud of that, but Readiness is an issue. I think that's one of the things we're really going to concentrate in this uh, subcommittee, the readiness uh, for our personnel. And this, this vaccine mandate, which ended up you know, kicking out 8,400 service members, I don't think it did much for the morale for the military, the morale for America. Um, the Army has really missed its uh, recruitment goals, 25% last year, 15,000 soldiers. And we live in an increasingly dangerous world where the communist Chinese government is the number one threat to our national security. We've got to be ready. We cannot afford the loss of any more soldiers. So I want to start with Under Secretary uh, um, Cisneros. And your response to Congressman Gates earlier, I was a little bit shocked when, you, when he asked you are we stronger? And you think we are stronger. How are we stronger after losing 8,400 service members? Congressman, thanks for the question. Um, we've had over 2 million service members who received the vaccine. Uh, that's allowed us to remain operational. It's allowed us to deploy forces. It's allowed us to continue training. Uh, it has allowed us to do the mission and carry out the national defense strategy. Uh, our retention is, is at record levels. Uh, so I would argue that the vaccine has been uh, an integral part of keeping the force ready and played a, a big part in ensuring our readiness of our force. But we now know that the, the vaccine does not completely prohibit the spread of COVID-19. So, uh, you know, looking back, uh, it's a little bit easier to do that, but how are we stronger by losing 8,400 people when say, this vaccine may not have prevented the spread of it in the first place? Congressman, what we do know what the vaccine has been effective as is, is keeping people alive and keeping them out of the hospital. And there's been good data and research on that. All right, next question for uh, Undersecretary uh, Jones. The Department of Air Force recently issued guidelines on removal of adverse actions related to refusal of COVID-19 vaccinations. Can you explain exactly what the Air Force is doing now to remove adverse service records? 
Representative, thank you for the question. Thanks for your support uh, for, for Whiteman Air Force Base. I was able to, to visit last year, and it's a, it's a great mission, uh, total force mission at the, supported out, out of the base. So in terms of adverse action, uh, we are doing a couple of things based on the bucket that you are in. Um, so you, if you are currently serving, um, and you um, followed the, um, the uh, excuse me, you submitted an accommodation request. Um, and if the adverse action is tied solely to your refusal of the vaccine, then the Air Force Personnel Center is taking steps now to remove that adverse paperwork from your file. And there'll be nothing left on that file. It'll be totally expunged. Well, uh, so I want to be clear about the caveat. If the only reason is the refusal to vaccinate, then AFPC, the Air Force Personnel Center, is going to remove that. If there are aggregate, aggravating factors- Such as? Other misconduct, okay. right? Other misconduct, um, then that'll have to be reviewed for what may be appropriate, right? So for those that are currently serving uh, that did not submit uh, a religious accommodation request or avail themselves of, of any of the uh, exemption processes, they have to initiate the process with the Air Force uh, Board for Correction of Military Records. Uh, for those that have already separated um, and would still like to, uh, for example, update their, their file, they would have to go through the Discharge Review Board. Gotcha. And so this has been well laid out in the, in the memo that Secretary Kendall uh, right. put out. Got 30 seconds left. Uh, let's go to uh, Under Secretary Camarillo. Maybe you can answer this. Will there be any tags, markers, codes associated with any service personnel that has been dismissed that will be recognizable by anyone uh, bringing these service members back? Will, they, will anyone know that these people left because and then brought back because of the mandate? Their discharge, Congressman, will be consistent with the NDAA. And uh, as Secretary Jones just explained, the Army's following a very similar process. If it's only related to uh, refusal to comply with the COVID vaccine mandate, those will be removed. Thank you again, witnesses. I yield back. Mr. Horsford. Thank you. I didn't expect to go so early. <laughs> I'm way down here at the end. I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Banks and Ranking Member Kim uh, for holding this hearing today, and I'm really pleased to be a part of this important uh, subcommittee, which really focuses on military um, health and families, and I'm really glad that we're having this conversation about COVID-19's impact on our service members and their families. Uh, since the start of COVID-19 pandemic, thousands of active, active duty service members have been deployed to civilian hospitals across the United States, as you indicated, to help take pressure off our medical staffs uh, as they battled the effects of COVID-19. And I wanna commend all of our service members, uh, especially those from the 99th medical group stationed at Nellis Air Force Base in my district, who were deployed to places uh, in California, during the Omicron wave to provide medical support at overrun hospitals. Service members stepped up to the plate when this country needed them most, and I would hope that, if nothing else, we can agree that our service members performed remarkably and should be commended. Um, Under Secretary Cisneros, it's good to see you on that side of the dais. Uh, miss you on this side, uh, but we're glad to have you there. Um, how did the services support the whole of government response to COVID-19, including sending military personnel to civilian hospitals to support COVID-19 related missions? Uh, Congressman, thank you for the question, and I, and I think you described it very well. Um, you know, we had serv service members both in the active duty and the reserve who deployed all over the country. Uh, to, they went to hospitals. Uh, we had service members that went and built hospitals and then served there as well. Uh, they administered uh, vac or, or COVID-19 tests. Uh, they administered the, the vaccinations to individuals. Um, they played an integral part in, in, in working through this vaccine, not only for the Department of Defense, but for the entire nation. Uh, and as well, as I say in my opening remarks, is you know we also played an integral part in ensuring the, the logistics of getting supplies where they needed to be and ensuring uh, that the vaccines were getting to different parts of the country where they needed. Uh, we were able to bring in supplies and from from uh, all over the world, whether it was, uh, you know, um, mask or, or uh, 
surgical suits that were, that were needed. Uh, the, the, uh, we were able to go out and, and, and do lots of things. The, the logistics, the purchasing power of the Department of Defense to go out and buy supplies that hospitals needed, uh, buying tests, buying, as I said, surgical gears, uh, the, the, uh, the, being able to go out and procure uh, ventilators uh, for hospitals that needed them. Um, this is all. This was all done through the Department of Defense, and uh, it played an integral part in helping us get through this pandemic. Well, if no one else has said it today, I want to thank our service members who played a critical role. Um, Under Secretary Cisneros, I also want to talk about DLD's long-term strategy to mitigate risk from COVID-19 and future pandemics. You know, we've heard a lot of talk today regarding recruitment and retention. But as several of my colleagues on our side have indicated, if we want to talk about recruitment and retention, and you talk to any service member and their family, ask them about the need for higher military pay. Ask them about more adequate on-base and off-base housing that supports the needs of their family. Talk about the long waiting list to get into childcare services and some of the facilities. I know under the last Congress, we expanded a number of those uh, opportunities, but I just really hope that this subcommittee would use our time in a bipartisan way to bring the voices of the service members and their families into the readiness discussion. Readiness is about the quality of life of our service members and their families. So I wanna encourage my colleagues to work with us to help make the military more attractive to young men and women who are interested in serving and to not politicize the health and well-being of those men and women. We are coming out of this pandemic, we are stronger, and it's because of the Department of Defense that we are in the position, the good position that we are to protect both our national defense and our international security around the world. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. I'll remind the gentleman there is a readiness subcommittee, and Chairman Rogers is setting up a quality of life task force within the Armed Services Committee. I'm sure he would be glad to hear about your interest in that task force as well. Mr. Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the esteemed colleagues. I'd ask that you keep it very brief as I want to get through this and I have a lot of questions. Uh, first, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to be uh, entered into record DD uh, Form 3176, DD Form 3177 for qualifications. Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Um, with that, I also just want to note something that uh, my colleague, Mr. Gates, had followed through on was the idea that these packages that were actually being submitted for a request of medical exemption or delay was being reviewed in a time span of about 12 minutes per to vet these to ensure the actual qualifications of whether they are qualified or not qualified. Now, have you seen these forms by chance, the DD uh, 3176 or 3177? Um, I'm not familiar with that form that you're referring to, but I have looked at some of the packets that have gone through the process of being evaluated. Okay. Um, well, let me go ahead and explain really quickly some of the questions on here, which is quite a lengthy, but it'll talk about the ideas of medical conditions and circumstances. It talks about your uh, circumstance for being vaccinated, why you would you'd feel that you need to be uh, uh, exempt from it. It talks about your religious liberties, things like that. Do you think that any, anyone on this panel can answer that you have the qualifications and or the vetting process to be able to do this within 12 minutes, which is exactly what the DODIG said the average time is? Representative, I would agree with my colleague here, Mr. Camarillo, when he stated earlier that these, these packages were, were giving a length. That's not what I asked. I asked, do you think they can be done in 12 minutes? And I, I'm, what I'm my response is that they were given over a lengthy view and, and looked so over. So 12 minutes is a lengthy view in your opinion? Uh, I don't think it was done in 12 minutes. I think they were so done the DOD IG is wrong is what you're saying then? You're on record for saying that the DOD Inspector General is incorrect in this? I think the, the DOD Inspector General looked at some kind of numbers and kind of did it and did some math and wrote a letter to the secretary of his opinion. Uh, it's my understanding there's still an IG report on this topic that is coming out uh, later this year. So staying with you, Under Secretary Cisneros, you said in your statement just a moment ago that the United States military is as strong now as ever, even with the 8,400 purged out of our military and the 25,000 in shortage in our recruitment. So you're saying that we don't need those additional 30 plus thousand troops is what you're saying to maintain strength? 
when my statement was, Congressman, is that the, the, vac the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine, allowed us to go out and to train. It allowed us to operate. It allowed us to deploy uh, around the world uh, and, and keep up our mission and, and, and carry out the national defense strategy and defend the nation. By, by increasing uh, we, battle fatigue, sir. Because I can tell you, I spent over seven years in Iraq, over three years in Afghanistan, Kosovo, Pakistan, was blown up twice in 2006. There is a such thing as battle fatigue. Maybe you haven't experienced it because there wasn't recruitment shortages to the level they are right now, but they do exist. Let me move on to my next question, which is simply this. Um, are you familiar with the DOD defense casualty analysis system? So can you repeat that? The, the Department of Defense it has a defense casualty analysis system. Are you aware of it? Yes, sir. So then you should be aware that from the time period of 2000 to 2021, that the actual number of deaths due to illness has not changed. And in fact, the highest year was in 2009 with 277. And meanwhile, it says as a result of due to illnesses, you have, and I'll read these off quickly, but from 2010 through 2021, you had 238, 252, 246, 214, 195, 196, 173, 171. It actually starts coming down. 2019, 174. Uh, 2020, 154, 2020, uh, 190, relatively unchanged in the last 22 years. Can you tell me again how the COVID vaccine contributed to that? What I would tell you, sir, is the COVID vaccine allowed us uh, to operate and to, to be able to deploy our forces around the world and make sure that we continue training and that we're able to, to carry out the national defense strategy and defend the nation. Okay, and just a quick question. I noted that it was very simple that it said that administrative exemptions were typically granted for service members who were within six months of separation or retirement. You know, this is almost like the arbitrary thing where COVID only exists when you stand up, you have to wear your mask, but when you sit down, it magically goes away. So are you saying then that members who had six months or less had less risk of actually spreading the virus as those who have a year or more? This is your policies, by the way, sir. That is what we were saying is when that was carried out, uh, when people were allowed to go, they were still required to meet certain, the force health protection guidance that was put out by the Department of Defense, or they were still serving. And that was at times wearing their mask and doing what needed to be done in order to protect themselves and others from the COVID-19. Uh, what was granted and what the services did, and I'll let them explain it further, but if a member was, was getting out and they had made the decision to get out and they were within six months of separation, they were given uh, the administrative accommodation. And last question, what actual uh, re-entry code was everyone given who was forced separated? You'd have to ask the services that, but I know there wasn't one specific. Each service has a different culture and they did it on their own, uh, depending on their service and their culture as to what they did. Well, I can tell you this, sir, as a military combat veteran and a proud service member, I will be pushing as well as for, I'm sure, that our, our chairman as well as for the Armed Services Chairman to allow these individuals who are unlawfully purged, in my opinion, to be re-entered into the military with their full benefits, their back pay, and be granted what they should have been given, which is a chance to serve our United States military. With that, I yield back. Mr. Davis. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Chair, to the ranking member. <clears throat> I want to start today, for me, having served our country, um, I realized that we lost over a million here in the nation. I would also highlight um, any service member, too, um, that loses their life. It raises concern for me. So my first line of questioning, looking at those who we know died, um, that we can look at the particular members, 96, the whole column, column of 690. What do we know about these cases that perhaps moving forward in the future, similar circumstances we might be able to prevent? Also, do we see any trends, any particular branches that these are more accounted for, in particular installa installations? CONAs versus overseas. What do we understand about these cases? Uh, Congressman, thanks for the question. And, and I, I don't have a breakdown by service. And I think each service could explain to you how many, or could tell you how many service members in their service died. But the one thing I will tell you that we do know is, as you stated, 96 service members uh, had passed away. Um, 
and there was also 36 family members, uh, 417 DOD civilian employees, and 141 DOD contractors that also passed away from COVID-19. But I will tell you, out of the 96 service members, what we do know is that 93 of them were not vaccinated. Okay. My next question, um, I understand that there were efforts to go out to hospitals, but what was taking place on the ground hospitals on our installations? Did we see that they were being overwhelmed with these hospitals, hospitalization cases? I think as we were, you know, uh, and thank you for that question because it really, I think, kind of gives, allows us to kind of explain really um, how our military is stretched, but yet how they're still able to carry out the mission. Uh, while we were going around, deploying around at hospitals around the nation, uh, supporting uh, overworked uh, physicians and, and communities and setting up hospitals for communities uh, that were overwhelmed by the COVID-19, uh, we still had to run our hospitals as well within the medical uh, treatment facilities throughout our Department of Defense, throughout DHA. And we continued to do that. Um, and, and so again, I think that just shows another uh, aspect of the resiliency of our military force and what they're capable of doing. And another question, when we look at the number of cases, not just the hospitalizations or the deaths, but the cases, are we able to understand how we're able to uh, better mitigate moving forward? Uh, pray to God that circumstances uh, do not occur. But what do we understand from those cases? Um, well, I, I think our, you know, we just like any other uh, hospital, our hospitals uh, experience the same things as hospitals across the nation. Um, you know, there there were uh, communities, especially some of our veterans that were, um, uh, you know, at risk because of their age and maybe some other pre-existing conditions that they may have had. Uh, we had to deal with those in our hospitals. Um, you know, the, the thing that we learned, I will say again, the, the most important thing that we learned was that the vaccine does work. Uh, the vaccine kept people out of the hospitals and it kept people alive. And for us, that's a win. But again, you know, yes, vaccinations work, but in some cases, it went beyond, as we can see, hospitalizations and deaths. And I'm just making a note there. But moving back now to a person that wants to re Enter. How, I mean, we've talked a little bit about that process, but I guess my question would be, uh, do we know, not necessarily how many have re-entered, but how many are actually now going through that process? I'll yield to the services on that if, uh, if they know how many um, have actually asked to come back into the service. Uh, but as I stated earlier, we already have a procedure uh, for this, for those that have left the military and want to come back in. Uh, we have a procedure for those that uh, think there's a discrepancy in, in their discharge and, and want to have it uh, corrected that they can go forward and do, and that's at the Board of Corrections. Um, but we will, uh, you know, we are going to continue to follow the procedures that we already have in place. I would love to hear uh, from the, the services. The services. Congressman, uh, just to be clear, there's two paths by which uh, anybody who is separated could come back. One is to talk to a recruiter and just re-enlist. The second is, as uh, Secretary Cisnero said, to go through the Board of Correction and Military Records. I don't have data on how many people were prior separations related to this, but we can get that for the record. Uh, sir, for the Department of the Navy, exactly the same process. An uh, ind individual can talk to a recruiter or the Board for Correction of Naval Records. We've had single digits uh, in terms of numbers of uh, individuals who've uh, explored the option of returning to service. Representative, thanks for the question. Uh, for those uh, Department of the Air Force veterans that received a general discharge, if they are interested in being reinstated, they'd have to first meet uh, the, uh, the Discharge Review Board to have their, their discharge characterization upgraded. Um, and once they were able to do that, if they did that successfully, then they could talk to a recruiter, assuming they um, met accession standards, would be able to apply to, to come back in. Gentlemen, time Thank you, has expired. Uh, Ms. Takuda. Thank you, Chair. Um, Under Secretary Raven, you noted in your testimony there was a critical moment in the early days of the pandemic where the, there was an outbreak, as we all know, 
um, very well. The USS Theodore Roosevelt, which led to a prolonged docking in Guam. We had over 1,300 confirmed cases, and sadly and tragically, the death of Chief Petty Officer Charles Thacker Jr. You know, we saw in that case the significant impact that infectious disease outbreaks can have, not just on our readiness and our ability to execute mission, but also training, maintenance, repair needs. Now, looking beyond COVID and what we've learned from COVID and infectious diseases, however, there may also be implications for our medical response and our ability to respond in any mass casualty event at sea that affects large numbers of our sailors at once. Um, you know better than I do, readiness is key in order to execute mission. What are the lessons we learned from the Navy responding effectively to infectious disease outbreaks or any mass casualty event as a result of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? And what steps have been taken to improve its future response, whether it's equipment, whether it's medical and operational chain of command, policies and procedures? We know a lot of these things unfortunately fell short and led to what we saw in the Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, absolutely, uh, and thank you for that question. Uh, first of all, uh, a key part of military readiness is medical readiness, and uh, we believe that uh, vaccines have helped preserve medical readiness to preserve military readiness. Um, as you stated, um, the, uh, the incident regarding the uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, was incredibly important, not only for what happened on the ship, but what it meant for out in the world. Uh, you mentioned 1,300 sailors uh, fell ill, about two dozen uh, had to go to the hospital for an intensive care, and the one service member who unfortunately uh, passed. Uh, this is a reminder that throughout history, uh, the number of uh, service member deaths from disease exceeds that uh, from direct enemy action. And so in the Department of the Navy, we continue to be committed to maintaining medical readiness and preparedness. Um, that's not only making sure we have uh, medical facilities that are ready uh, and medical personnel who are trained, uh, but supplies on hand to be ready for the next uh, major event, whatever it may be. Okay, well, I definitely just hope that uh, we've learned from this experience uh, and that we are preparing for, sadly, what will inevitably be next, whether it is mass casualties or, or outbreak. Um, speaking to the entire panel, we know that the pandemic caused unprecedented amounts of stress on the American people, um, but also for many of our service members and their families as well. And uh, the GAO found that telehealth mental health visits uh, surged dramatically in the in early days of the pandemic uh, before declining a bit and tabling off to a stable level, uh, still above the pre-pandemic levels. And I think all of us in this room know that in terms of mental health, this has always been an area of soreness, if you ask me, um, for the military and making sure that we really provide the care and support to our military men and women. Uh, ensuring our service members get easy access uh, to mental health health care is essential to force readiness, in my humble opinion. And as we adapt to now life with COVID and quite frankly, long COVID in many cases, I'm concerned that we will um, lose some of the momentum and progress we made during the pandemic to provide access to mental health care services, um, but also to encourage folks to actually get the help and support that they need. And so um, to all of you here today, that's willing to answer, what steps have your organizations taken to make sure that we build on the improvements in mental health and behavioral health access um, from during the pandemic and how are we gonna promote its continued usage um, going forward? Thank you for the question. As Secretary Austin always says, uh, mental health is health and the health of our service members is definitely his, con you know, one of his big concerns is one of my major concerns. Um, you know, as you stated, uh, telehealth was something that really expanded during the pandemic. The ability to do uh, mental health through telehealth is something uh, that uh, it was, was a tremendous help to our service members. Uh, we did over 65,000 and have that ability to do 65,000 uh, telehealth, mental telehealth uh, uh, calls in a, a year. But it is something that we continue to work on, um, that we want to continue to grow and improve. Um, uh, mental health is, uh, well, the, the lack of behavioral health specialists is not only a concern throughout the military, but a concern throughout the whole nation. There's just a lack of providers that are out there. So we are doing what we can uh, to increase that, and one of the ways is through telehealth. But we are also uh, taking a, a public health approach, um, you know, our, our family, uh, our, our, our family centers are there. Uh, or to, to, if, if somebody just needs somebody to talk to, there's a variety of counselors that we have. I know all the services, and I'll let them kind of explain more how they're expanding services. Uh, our schools are, are making counselors available to our, our, our students when they need them. 
Uh, I'm talking specifically at our Dodia schools, but I'll let the uh, services continue to The end. gentleman's time has expired. Ms. Sewell. Thank you. I look forward to the continued conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I begin, I'd like to say that I am indeed thrilled to be a new member of the House Armed Services Committee and, of course, the Subcommittee on Military Personnel. I'd like to really thank you, um, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Kim, for allowing us to have this conversation today. I look forward to advocating uh, for all of the military personnel in my district, including those serving at Maxwell Air Force Base, uh, the 187th Fighter Wing, as well as 117th Refueling Wing that are located in my district. I'm glad that we're having this uh, conversation today about COVID-19 and having it with senior leadership in our military. The COVID uh, pandemic posed a unique threat to our military, not just because it endangered our service men and women health, but also it posed a threat to the readiness. I'm uh, proud that the DOD took the necessary steps uh, to vaccinate our men and women in uniform. Moreover, I would like to thank everyone of our uh, servicemen and women who played a role in developing, uh, deploying, and administration of the COVID-19 vaccination. Um, to date, almost 9 million total doses of vaccine has been administered uh, to our service members. And as um, Secretary Cisneros pointed out, uh, we lost 96 service members. One loss is too many. But when you, um, when you focus in on the fact that 93 of the 96 that we lost were not vaccinated, um, I have to tell you the fact that we are now uh, we now don't, don't do, do not make it mandatory gives me great pause for thought. And um, I wanted to ask you, Secretary um, Ortez Jones, I know that um, Maxwell Air Force Base is home of Air University. We're very proud of that. But during the pandemic, how did, um, how did the COVID-19 affect uh, military installation and your personnel, moving personnel in and out? Um, and what lessons were learned in terms of that. And I also wanted to ask your thoughts about um, what the you know, reversal of policy not requiring a vaccination has done with respect to um, the morale culture of, uh, of the service. Well, Representative, thank you for your support from Maxwell Air Force Base. Um, to your, your immediate question about how did we deal with that, I mean, as you know, we have many international students. Um, and so one of the things that I'm really proud of the team did um, early on is as soon as those international students arrived on base in that first week, if they were not already vaccinated, we offered them the vaccine. Uh, we also followed um, all of the, uh, the practices as recommended by the CDC to ensure that we could continue functioning. So masking, social distancing, increasing awareness, uh, contact tracing, um, and then when folks were identified as being symptomatic, um, uh, you know, um, quarantining and taking all the measures again that could ensure those classes could uh, could continue and, and that the, the base could function as as intended. So, um, again, lots of lessons learned about you know when you when you vaccinate and, and follow the CDC guidance, um, there are uh, you know you can continue to, to execute mission as was done at Maxwell Air Force Base as was done throughout the Department of the Air Force Enterprise. You know, has it? I I know that my time is drawing near, and I really am curious to know if there's been an, any increase in military personnel refusal to receive other mandatory um, vaccinations like hepatitis, like measles, uh, tetanus. Have you seen that happen? Um, and if so, how do you how are you addressing it? Um, Representative, what we have seen at this point um, are there are uh, four cases where individuals submitted um, a religious accommodation request for COVID and other vaccines. Um, and so uh, it's, it's not a, um, a significant uptake. That is a, a manageable number. And again, there is a process in place to ensure that folks are, one, aware of that process, provide the sufficient information so those can be reviewed um, can be reviewed accordingly. If I, if I may say, you know, to, uh, readiness has been uh, addressed here a number of times, and, and, and one thing I would um, offer for, for the committee's consideration is when we talk about, you know, medical readiness, one of those things is our family members, our service members' ability to access health care, and a lot of that is tied to medical providers that um, don't take TRICARE. 
Uh, so I would recommend for this committee, if you, if you really focus on medical care, you would look at um, steps to encourage medical providers to accept TRICARE. And that's directly related to the future readiness of, of the force. We know a lot of the service members of the future are dependents of today. And when they have better access to health care through more TRICARE providers, they will be healthier pipeline into our service. So uh, a, a request to, to please encourage your medical providers to accept TRICARE. Thank you. The gentlewoman's time has expired. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being with us today. We're off to a great start with the Military Personnel Subcommittee. I intend for this subcommittee to be the most active of all of the subcommittees with the help of the ranking member. And uh, we're off to a good start today on an important topic. So with there being no further business, the subcommittee stands adjourned.